Okay, so here we are. Let's talk about the infrared spectra of ketones. When you look at the IR spectra, in this case of acetone, um, there's one peak in particular that pops up um, very much conclusively, and it is the peak of the CO double bond, the carbonyl group. This shows up at about 1700, 1715 in this case, and this peak is a very strong peak. Um, it's semi-broad, but it's mostly a sharp peak. Uh, but the thing to be really attentive about is how strong the peak is. It goes almost all the way to the x-axis, right? Um, and this is very indicative of carbonyl bonds being present in your compound, and it won't be exclusive to ketones, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, anything that contains a carbonyl will have and possess a strong peak nearby the 1700 region. All right, now, for the ketones, we do not have any CHs bound to alkenes or alkyne carbons. Therefore, you don't see much of anything above 3000. Uh, now, the thing that you observe right here is actually uh, water impurities that get absorbed by acetone. So this is not uh, the purest sample, but it's, you know, more or less representative of what you will see in the laboratory. All right, so keep an eye out on this number, 1715. All right, if I change that to a derivative, so now this is uh, 2-butanone. It's just another ketone. We have a value of 1718 for that strong carbonyl peak. Once more... No real peaks above 3,000. Everything is slightly below 3,000, representing the alkane CHs. Uh, change this to 3-pentanone, uh, just another ketone. We are still around that 17, 15, 17, 18 um, wave number for the carbonyl carbon. All right, now let's look at the cyclic structure. So we have... Um, Cyclohexanone, which has once again strong carbonyl peak at about 1717. And we don't have any peaks above 3000 because we don't have any alkene CHs or alkyne CHs. But notice what happens now. So, up until now, all the linear ketones and the hexagonal, so the cyclohexa cyclohexanone ketone fall around 1717 but notice what happens when i start contracting the size of the ring let's go to the five member ring this is no longer at the 17 teens now it's close to 1750. that's a pretty big increase for the wave number um, the peak itself is pretty strong in magnitude right so you see it almost reaching the x-axis now let's contract the ring a bit further let's go to the four member ring the four member ring goes even higher to 1783. Um, and you might think that that's uh, rather peculiar and, you know, maybe not think much of it. Um, it's still roughly in the 1700 region, but I kind of want to address why this happens. Because it's actually an interesting, an interesting little um, connection between spectroscopy and hybridization. You may recall from an early lecture that when you look at the cyclic structures, now, mind you, this specific carbon bond angle is not going to be exactly 109.5, but it's going to be somewhat close to it. And uh, when you get to the five-member ring, you have a bond angle of about 108, maybe a little bit less. And the four-member ring, you have a bond angle of 90. So the idea right here is that because the bond angles are decreasing as you go from a six-member ring to a five-member ring to a four-member ring, uh, the bond angle is directly related to the percent P content uh, of hybridization that your orbital possesses, with 109.5 representing your true sp3 hybridized orbital on carbon. But um, if you start decreasing the angle, this will only happen if you increase the percent p, because the p orbitals are basically at 90 degrees of each other. So this will allow you, increasing the p content will allow you to decrease the bond angle of a particular formula. So one way to look at this is to say that, okay, well, to go from the six member ring to the five member ring, which has a lower bond angle, you're gonna increase the P content by some amount, but you will also decrease the S content by that same amount. Because at the end of the day, you can only have four orbitals combined to make 
the hybridization happen. Uh, so if you're going to increase the peak content beyond three, you must decrease the S content uh, below one. And by the time you get to the four member ring, this is even taking place to a higher extent. You're going to increase the peak content some more and decrease the S content by a, you know, a greater amount. Okay, so now this is the deal. You can't just make P orbitals appear out of nowhere. Um, and three is really the maximum you could have um, for any specific atom. So if you're going to be increasing the P content, it has to come from somewhere else. And specifically, it comes from the external atoms on the rings. And the external atom is your carbonyl bond. So what this means is that the carbonyl bond is going to lose P content, but it will gain S content because the CC bond of the rings are going to be giving away their S content in exchange for P content. Um, so conversely, the carbonyl bond that is outside of the ring will be gaining S content and giving away P content. So what you're seeing right here is that the uh, cyclobutanone formula contains the greatest amount of S content and the cyclohexanone contains the least amount of S content. And generally speaking, the greater the S content is, the shorter the bond and the stronger the bond becomes. And from the point of view of IR spectroscopy, if the bond is stronger, it's going to require more energy for you to make it vibrate. So this explains, this hybridization approach explains why you have higher wave numbers going from the cyclohexanone to the cyclopentanone all the way down to the cyclobutanone structures. And it's an excellent way of kind of applying hybridization theory to spectroscopy. All right, so this brings us to the aldehydes. The aldehydes have two specific features that are uh, noteworthy. The first one is, of course, the carbonyl peak. Uh, aldehydes still contain that CO double bond. So it, unsurprisingly, you do have that carbonyl peak appearing a little bit higher than that of the ketones, but it's roughly in the ballpark the same. Um, so personally, if I were just looking at the carbonyl carbon, I probably wouldn't be able to tell apart the aldehyde from the ketone. But the thing that gives it away as being an aldehyde is the peaks right here between 28 and 2600 wave numbers. You see this um, double uh, dip, if you will, that appears in that region. And these peaks right here are actually representing the CH bond that is directly bound to the carbonyl. And you can look at another derivative, another aldehyde derivative. You have your aldehyde peak once more at about 1720 or 1727. And then you have your dual peaks between 28 and 2600. Almost like your, you know, your molar, your jaw, you know. <laughs> uh, and then looking at this other aldehyde um, that contains a cyclohexane ring attached to it, you still have those two peaks between 28 and 2600. You still have your strong peak at about 1727. All right, so this is the deal. Uh, and I kind of wanted to explain this to you guys because uh, this was bothering me for some time the first time I learned about it because up until now, we've said that carbon hydrogen bonds, because the hydrogen is so small, you create really strong bonds. The, the bonds are short and the shorter the bond gets, the stronger the, the bond ends up being. So you end up having values above 3000 and yet the CH bond of an aldehyde ends up below 3000. So what gives, what, what makes this different? And one way to think of this is to invoke the highest occupied molecular orbitals and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals within the same molecule. If you consider the CH bond of that aldehyde as being um, a LUMO, right? So if you're looking at the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals of that CH bond, it will look something like this. And the significance of that LUMO is that it is right next to an oxygen that has lone pairs next to it. And that lone pair is pretty much situated in the perfect symmetry, you know, right next to it and parallel to it to provide electron density. So the lone pair of that oxygen is acting as the HOMO in the molecule. And that um, Higgs molecular orbital is providing electron density to the LUMO of that CH bond. 
And anytime that you populate or partially populate lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals, like the one right here, which is anti-bonding in nature, you destabilize and weaken the CH bond. And the weaker the bond becomes, the lower wave number energy it will need to absorb. So this explains why you end up having absorbances below 3000 for the CH bonds of aldehydes. Not to be confused with CH bonds that are, you know, farther away from the carbonyl carbon, right? Those ones will still absorb at, you know, at slightly below 3000 or if they happen to be alkene CHs above 3000. But the CH bond directly bound to the carbonyl carbon, that's the one that's going to appear between 2600 and 2800. All right, so this brings us to um, the alcohols. Uh, this will probably be the last um, functional group we'll talk about in this video. All right, so the alcohols uh, do not have a carbonyl uh, bond, so that you don't have a CO double bond. So notice that at about 1700, there is nothing, completely absent, right? But what you do have is an oxygen-hydrogen bond, which because hydrogen is small, it is going to appear at values higher than 3000. Now, the other thing about it though, is that in contrast to CH bonds, OH bonds are vastly more acidic. We're talking about easily 10 to the 10 orders of magnitude more acidic. So a trillion, more, a trillion times more acidic really. And so what happens is that when you have an alcohol, usually the the proton gets exchanged between alcohol molecules. And what this results in is a, a broadening of the peaks. So instead of having the sharp peaks that we saw normally for the alkynes and the alkenes, now we see a broad peak above 3000. And this is very indicative of OH bonds and uh, to some degree also NH bonds. So if you have a means, a means will kind of show a similar feature with alcohols perhaps being slightly more broad. Uh, but once more, there is no carbonyl present in this molecule, so we have no peak, no strong peak around 1700. Uh, here we have another alcohol. This one is even more um, prominent. The peak is definitely above 3000, but it's pretty broad and it's pretty strong as well. Okay, so we're going to use that premise to ultimately compare the alcohols to carboxylic acids, but I want to save the carboxylic acid and the rest of the carbonyls for the next video. Uh, but keep in mind that all th those OH bonds and NH bonds potentially are going to show up above 3000 and they're going to be kind of broad. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.